Last week was an interesting week for me personally, not because I was not here, but it was just an interesting week. The two weeks prior to that were interesting as well. Some of you know that I am at times a little transparent with my own faith journey, including my own faith struggles. So to put something in perspective, uh, I had had two busy weeks in a row. And when I say busy, I mean real busy. And with all of that busyness, it's easy for people like me anyway to listen to the little devil whisper in your ear. And it's easy for you to then, when you're tired, when you let your guard down, to start believing some things that may not be true. So I kind of went through this little period of two weeks where I had some doubts, not about my faith, not about my salvation, not about eternity, but about my purpose and if I was doing what God really wanted me to be doing. And it was not just a little whisper, it became a scream. And in the midst of all of that, I became irritable. I became difficult to live with. Rhonda can attest to that. Katie and maybe Joel can attest to that a little bit. And so when that happened, they pretty much, well, Rhonda more so, and Katie being a therapist person. So, but Rhonda gave me a spiritual side of things, and Katie was giving me a more practical side of things. And this was me during that time. I don't want to listen to either one of you. So what I, what I had to do was get away from all of the noise and face those doubts and face those concerns. I'm sharing that with you to say this to you today. All of us, at some point in our life, we will face something that will cause us to wonder, God, where are you at? Or, God, why is this happening to me? Or, God, why did you let this happen? I mean, the list is just as endless as me and you. Now, this past Friday, I believe it was Friday. No, it was Thursday this past Thursday. Uh, one of the patients that I see had passed away, and the daughter of the patient asked me to call the gentleman who was going to do the funeral because I'd been seeing this guy for about two times a month for the past year and a half just to give him a little extra information. Is, and as he and I were talking, he said something that I was not expecting, but probably needed. He said, you have a heart for hospice. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm, I'm tired of hospice. Not because it's a bad work. Miss Joyce, you did hospice for I don't know how many years. How many years did you do it? Ten? I got you beat. Now, I've got you beat now. I, I've been doing it for almost 13 years. It's not a bad work. It's a needed work. It's a helpful work. But, but here's what I'm trying to say. When you feel exhausted, tired, when your spiritual guard is down and the devil whispers in your ear, all of these different thoughts can pop into your mind. And you can question so many things. So with that said, I want you and me today to think about not just the resurrection, but think about when doubt roars back into your life. Because it's not a matter of if doubt will roar back, it's a matter of when doubt will roar back into your life. Because we all will face something and struggle with something that will cause us to wonder, God, do you really care about me and what I'm going through? And now for me, it culminated when I had to pay my tax bill. So that was sort of the icing on the cake. So sometimes we have not a thing, but we have many things that just seem to pile on. So in the past couple, three weeks or so, we've been looking 
at John's gospel near the end of Jesus' life. We saw him crucified. We saw him buried. We saw him raised from the dead. And we've seen how different people have reacted and responded to his crucifixion and his resurrection. But here's what I want you to think about. For those of us here in this room right now who say with certainty, I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I believe he was buried dead. I believe that he was raised from the dead. And I have trusted him to forgive me of my sin, and I'm going to heaven when I die. For most of us, we have no problem believing that resurrected Jesus will bring us to heaven. But we have a problem at times trusting that Jesus, resurrected Jesus, can handle our day-to-day problems. <laughs> and we kind of settle and wonder where God's at in the everyday moments of life. So in this story that I want to read today, whether you're struggling with a relationship or whether you're struggling with money or whether you're dealing with your job or whether you're dealing with the list is just as endless as you are, I want you to know something today. God can still give you peace in whatever storm you may be going through. And he will give you endurance while you're going through the storm. So in this story, let's just dive right in. John 20, verses uh, 24 through 29. One of the 12 disciples, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, was not with the others when Jesus came. They told him, We have seen the Lord. But he replied, I won't believe it unless I see the nail wounds in his hands, put my fingers into them, and place my hand into the wound in his side. We're going to fast forward a little now. Verse 26. Eight days later, the disciples were together again, and this time Thomas was with them. The doors were locked, but suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them. Peace be with you, he said. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and look at my hands. Then he said to Thomas, put your hand into the wound in my side. Don't be faithless any longer. Believe. Thomas exclaimed, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, You believe because you have seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. Now those are really interesting and powerful words. This story, two primary characters, Thomas and Jesus. Thomas is someone that is, has been not just nicknamed the twin, but in our day he got the nickname Doubting Thomas. Thomas. Aren't we all a little like Thomas sometimes where we just doubt a little bit? Or maybe we doubt a lot. When Jesus first appeared to the disciples on resurrection day, Thomas wasn't there. For whatever reason, he was absent. And they, meaning Peter and John and and James and Matthew and the others, unanimously said to Thomas, We've seen Jesus. He's alive. We were sitting in the room. The doors were locked. The windows were shut. We were minding our own business, and Thomas suddenly, just out of nowhere, boom, there he was. We saw him. And Thomas said, yeah, I'm not buying it. I don't believe it. In fact, Thomas, as they talked, became so entrenched. He just became so stubborn. He said, I'm not going to believe that Jesus is alive unless I see him with my eyes and I take my finger and I thrust it into the nail prints in his hand and then thrust my hand into his spear-pierced side. I will not believe. I refuse to believe. It's a lot like us today, isn't it? Well, that was Thomas. Well, Thomas was there the next time. 
When Jesus in the same conditions appeared, apparently Jesus spoke to Thomas before he spoke to the others. Don't miss that, okay? Because when we're going through some serious doubts, when we're wondering, God, where are you at in the midst of my little storm? He knows your name because he didn't just say, to the one here who doesn't believe that I'm still alive, he literally said, Thomas. He looked at Thomas and he said to Thomas, Thomas, I knew and I heard what you said just eight days ago. Now, just think, this, this was eight days, so Thomas is wandering in doubt for eight days, and he said, Thomas, eight days ago you said you wouldn't believe unless you saw me. You said, Thomas, you wouldn't believe unless you saw the nail prints in my hand. Here's my hand. Put your finger in it. Okay, now, I'm putting myself in Thomas's shoes right now. Ooh, I have seen in my life a lot of people who have passed, a lot. I don't touch dead people. I've never, I can't say never. I don't want to touch somebody who's passed. It's just not my thing. If you want to do it, that's your business. When Rhonda passes, I might touch her. I might even give her a little kiss on the forehead, but I don't think so. I might just blow her a little kiss. See you soon. Okay, close it now. I don't know. I, I don't know. I mean, I can't say what I will do because sometimes we say what we'll do and we don't know what we're going to do until we get there. Well, Thomas heard Jesus say it, and then Jesus didn't hesitate. He said in Thomas one more thing. Take your hand and just yes, thrust it right in. Okay, ooh, no. I don't want to do that. And Thomas didn't either. When Thomas saw Jesus and he heard the conversation, Thomas literally fell to the ground and he exclaimed these very simple words, My Lord and my God. You are my Lord. You are my God. He had to be thinking, what was I thinking? Why did I not believe what my brothers had told me? I said I had to see, and now I've seen, and I kind of wish I could unsee it because I didn't believe when I had a chance to believe their testimony alone. Jesus, though, was a master of teaching. Jesus could have come up and just touched Thomas on his head, his shoulder, and said, it's okay, Thomas. It's, it's, it's fine. Everybody struggles with faith. Everybody has trouble not believing. I mean, hey, this was a pretty big thing, Thomas, because you saw me die. You saw me buried. You saw the stone rolled in front of the grave. And you heard them talk about it. But yet, you know, Thomas, it's hard to believe some things. I mean, this was a pretty big miracle here. Jesus didn't say that. He simply said to Thomas and everybody in every generation thereafter, you believe because you've seen. Blessed are those who believe without seeing. Now that, that statement alone deserves a little bit of explanation Jesus didn't say, well, your faith isn't good enough. Or your faith isn't very strong. Actually, Jesus was saying, Thomas, I'm glad you've believed. And I'm glad that I had the opportunity to show you and prove to you that I'm alive. See, that was worth something. Thomas's faith was not invalid. Thomas's faith wasn't worthless. As I'm guaranteeing you, if you haven't had a Thomas moment, you will have a Thomas moment somewhere in your life. It's going to happen. 
I mean, I can just about guarantee it. I would be willing to take money and bet on it. That's how confident I am. And I don't gamble with real money, just in my imagination, because I always lose, and that's why I don't gamble with real money. But with this one, I believe I would gamble with real money that at some point in your life, you're going to be just like Thomas. And you're going to say, I won't do it, but you will. You will face something, and you will go through something that will cause you to doubt that the resurrected God, Jesus Christ, is somehow in some way failing to meet your need and what you've prayed for and what you've asked for. And it will cause a spiritual crisis in your life. And you'll wonder, God, if you really loved me, why are you not answering this prayer the way I prayed for it to be answered? And therein your struggle will kind of work itself out or you'll walk away going, I don't believe anymore. Here's what I want us to learn from this story. It's not a question of doubt entering into your life at some point. You may say this, I will never doubt that Jesus is Christ, that Jesus is God. I won't doubt that. But I want to put a little warning here. There have been a lot of people who have said, I've studied scripture, I've experienced whatever. They professed Christ, they were baptized, they, they, they did all of the right things, and then a crisis came into their life. And then they walked away from the faith, including preachers. Preachers. I mean, People who went to seminary, preacher school, studied the Bible and said, nah, there's no God. If a preacher can, then why can't any of us have such an experience? Think about it. We believe, I believe, Jesus really lived. I don't believe he was a made-up person, a made-up character with a made-up story. I believe that Jesus did live a sinless, perfect life. Why? I've never seen Jesus. I've never met him face-to-face, -face, humanly speaking. I've never touched his body. I've never went through any of those. I mean, I, I, but I believe. I believe he died on a cross. I believe that he was buried, and I believe he was dead when he was buried, and I believe he was miraculously raised from the dead. I read Scripture. By the way, there are people that say Scripture is not true. I don't believe that either. But see, when, when you have a doubt, and the devil whispers in your ear, if you keep listening to the devil, you're going to be robbed of a very precious gift. When I knelt on my knees at the, at the age of 18 and I asked Jesus to come into my life and save me from my sin, I still to this day believe that he really did. And I really believe that today he is still with me. But I've never seen Jesus, but I have experienced his presence in my life. And I believe the testimony of John and Matthew and Luke and, and Mark and Paul and the others who were with Jesus, even though they are long dead. And I believe the testimony of those prophets in the Old Testament who said that Jesus is coming, even though they did not use the name Jesus. You see, as I look at the whole story, I believe there is a God who loves me more than I will ever understand and who is walking with me to this day and will take me to a place called heaven someday in the future. I believe that with all of my heart. 
But it doesn't mean there are moments when I struggle with my own junk. I can tell you without any numbers because there are too many. But I want you just to ask yourself or think about this for a moment. For those of you who have had relationship problems, meaning you're married or you wanted to get married or the person sitting next to you, your wife, your husband, you kind of look at them sometimes and go, I don't even know why I'm with you. And you've prayed for God to change him or her. Or you look at that child of yours that you brought into this world and you nurtured and loved and, and you just wonder sometimes, what happened to you? Why do you live that way? And you pray for that child, and you pray for that child, and you pray for that child to change and do what's right, and you see no change. You see no change in that man you're married to or that woman you married to. Or maybe you came from an abusive family where your mom or your dad were drunks or alcoholics or drug addicts or or they had other issues and you felt unloved and unappreciated and you wondered and you prayed and you prayed and you prayed and you, you pray today and you wonder, God, why won't they change? Or you gone through life where money problems just seem to be the thing. Seems like you take two steps or maybe you get one step ahead and then all of a sudden you find yourself three steps back again. And you pray and you pray and you pray and you just keep wanting for it to get better and it just seems to never get better. And you wonder, God, why don't you answer my prayer? Or someone in your family gets sick, go to the doctor and you find out it's cancer or something else and you pray and you pray and you pray and you pray and you lose them they don't get better they pass away and you just wonder God why didn't you answer that prayer see this is real life isn't it and it's real life that can cause our doubt to roar back into our life and rob us of our faith. We just can get tired of wondering, God, if you really love me, isn't there more than just heaven? Well, none of this is in this story, Thomas, by the way. Thomas didn't believe, he just didn't believe Jesus was raised from the dead. Thomas said, I'm not going to believe unless I see it with my own eyes, unless I can touch it and feel it with my own hands. But isn't that the way many of us deal with our everyday problems? God is distant. We pray to a distant God. And I don't mean distant because he's distant, distant, but we feel he's different. By the way, the emphasis on the word feel was on purpose. We feel that God is dif distant, far away, not involved, uncaring, just out there. That maybe he hears us, maybe he doesn't hear us, and maybe he wants to do something. And we just struggle with God really loving us. Well, many ways we're like Thomas we want God to show up in a big way in a miraculous way and show us like we want God to physically appear right before us and say like Thomas had okay you really want me to show you I'm 
the real deal? Here I am. We don't, we don't get that, do we? We just, we just hear the stories. I think of, um, I think of um, Job for a moment. Poor Job. If you know the story of Job, you know the story. If you don't know the story of Job, here's the, the heartbeat of Job. One day the devil went to heaven. Okay, that made me think of that song, The Devil Came Down to Georgia. All right. Georgia's not heaven. It's a great state, but it ain't heaven. So the devil went to heaven, and I can't, I can't, I'm going to have to do it. I was looking for a soul to steal. And he said, I got this guy named Job who will curse you, God, if you let me get after him. And God said, ah, Job, he'll stay faithful to the end. He's not going to break. And the old devil said, you'll let me get at him. And God said, tell you what, you can do whatever you want to Job except take his life. <laughs> what kind of deal is that? See, the devil looked at Job and said, I can break him. And God said, go at it. You may feel a little like Job, that you were in some heavenly cosmic experience between God and the devil to break you. What happened to Job? In a very short time, all of Job's children died. Not just one, all of them. All of them. Think about that. The devil took all of his children. And then the devil took all of Job's means to make money. Job was very rich. So now he's childless, broke. The devil still wasn't done because Job has not yet cursed God. He made him sick, like boils all on his body, painful, just nasty, disgusting, just gross things on his body. Job's friends, his three best friends said, you have sinned greatly, you need to curse God and just die. His wife nagged him day in and day out with the same words, curse God and die. Day in and day out, Job is sitting there wondering what he had done to deserve all of that. And Job said to his friends and his wife, I ain't done nothing to deserve this. Don't miss what Job just said. When you go through things that cause your faith to doubt, chances are you haven't done anything to deserve any of it. Did you hear me? You probably haven't done a single thing to deserve what you're going through. Because Jesus told us when he walked this earth, he said, I have come to give you life and to give it to you abundantly. That's what we want to cling to, isn't it? He also said in that same speech, and the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy. What? You and me. The devil wants to rob us of what God wants to give us. And when we listen to that voice, kind of like I listened recently, the doubts will roar back into your mind and your heart, and you, if you are not careful, you will believe the lies from the pits of hell itself. And that's not a good place to be. Well, near the end of Job's story, Job kind of has this moment of breakdown where he says, God, if you really loved and cared for me, then God, what? You wouldn't have let none of this happen. God had been silent throughout this entire time. Y'all know silence is very deafening, by the way. I mean, who wants to live 
you pray and 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 God doesn't answer your prayers and you're just like, God, where are you at? Why, 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 why? God was silent. And God finally spoke and said, Job, who created everything? Who made you? And Job, who do you think you are doubting all of this? I've I've been Job before too. I've been Job. I've been Thomas. This is what I want you to understand. I don't know what you are going through, have gone through, or will go through. But you will go through something that will cause you doubt. And even though you know what you know, it's easy to get a little impatient. But you cannot allow that to rob you of what God wants to pour into you. Jesus said it in John's Gospel, chapter 14. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives. My peace I give you. I don't understand how that works. But I understand what it feels like to experience God's peace. When your world is turned upside down and when you look around your your life and into the lives of those around you and you see what you're not experiencing, the devil is robbing you of peace. He's robbing you of peace. He's just taking it away from you bit by bit, piece by piece. And he whispers in your ear, God really doesn't love you and God really doesn't care for you. And if you really believe all of that hoopla about the abundant life, then you're just fooling yourself. The devil even whispers, there's no such thing as God. There's no such thing as heaven. He just keeps going on and on. And he'll just slowly try to chip away and cut out of your life the foundation that gives you hope. So when we are facing our doubt, we've got to come back and say, Jesus, I can't get this on my own. I can't have peace on my own. I need you to give me something I could never get on my own. And that's a journey. And it starts with you knowing Jesus died on the cross. It starts with you knowing that he was buried dead. It starts with you knowing he was raised from the dead. You see, that is the foundation of our faith. And if you don't believe that, you are without hope. Do you hear me? If you don't believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, if you don't believe that and accept that, You are without hope. And you're just going to go through life with occasional hope, occasional peace that never lasts. So when you know who Jesus is, you know that he, as Thomas explained, my Lord and my God, when you can say with certainty, Jesus, you are God, and I completely put my trust in you, then when doubt roars back, you can can win. You will win. If you keep looking to the one who made it all possible. You see, Thomas didn't want to believe, but he, he had to believe in the one who could make a difference. 
God's going to keep his word. He's going to provide what you need. He's probably not going to give you what all you want, okay? We don't always get what we want. But he'll give you what you need. So today, this is what I'm asking you to do. God, help me believe. Help me believe. Help me believe. Jesus told Thomas, you believe because you've seen me. Blessed are those who believe without seeing me. I'm going to put just a little twist and then I'm going to pray in what I just said. The twist is this. You can actually see Jesus today, not him but you can see Jesus in people like me. Meaning, I've experienced good times, bad times, challenging times, but Jesus does live in me. He has changed me. He lives in me and in my heart, and he overflows within me. So you sort of seen Jesus in my own frailty. I hope you believe today. 